Okay, welcome back everybody to our second lecture on BC 106, Interpreting Scripture. I see um, <clears throat> some question on the chat. Uh, Kennedy asks a question. Why is it that in some marriages sometimes, during childbearing, the mother dies even though she is married? So the question that Kennedy asks is, why is um, that the mother dies in some marriages, even though she is married? So obviously uh, there are complications and problems that result in this. So Kennedy, we must understand that First Timothy chapter two is not uh, is, is is written to believers. It is written to, uh, it's a promise that is given, like all other promises, uh, provision of God that is given to believers. But we will have to appropriate it. We have to say, God, this is for me, I'm taking it. So in the world, we're going to face all kinds of problems. So we will, in Romans chapter 8, Paul explains that everything in this world, in creation, is in a state of corruption. That means it has gone away from God's original design. So God originally designed for childbearing to be a blessing, no problems. Um, it's a way to fire them and Eve to multiply and fill the earth. But after the fall, corruption came in. Romans chapter 8, verses uh, uh, 20 to 25, you can see it. Corruption came in. All of creation was subject to corruption, to the bondage of corruption. And uh, which means that things deviated from God's original design. So sin brought that in. Then there are, there's what Satan does. There are things that we do to ourselves. So there are at least three major factors that that are causing problems one is the corruption that came through the fall second is our own actions when we don't take care of our own bodies and third is what the enemy does to steal kill and destroy and therefore when we talk about this particular con thing subject of childbearing childbearing is impacted or affected and in some cases the mother dies is that God's will? That's not God's will. But we understand that there are these things that have deviated from the will of God, which caused these things to happen. And that is where we as believers should know about our covenant with God, should know what God has provided for us, and take a hold of that covenant by faith, knowing that we are going to face these challenges in life. But when we fail to do that, then then obviously the promise of God is not going to come into effect automatically. It has to be appropriated by faith. I hope that helps, Kennedy. I'm just saying it in a very concise way. Um, but uh, we have a book on healing and deliverance, and that a lot of questions are ex answered there in that book. So I'd refer you to that book. Uh, yeah. All right, let's see how much more we can cover today. We'll move forward with our next question. So we'll just, I'll, I'll go through some of these things a little quickly. Um, is water baptism necessary for salvation? So this, you know, in some parts of the Christian church, this can be a big argument. People fight about this. But what do we see in scripture? We see that salvation is a free gift that is given by grace and received by faith. Salvation is a gift of God. You receive by faith. So water baptism is an obedience to the command. It is a command for believers to be baptized. And water baptism is obedience. You're obeying the commands. But we see in the New Testament that water baptism is an expression of salvation. It's an expression of your faith in Jesus. It's not the means for salvation. Right? 
Salvation is through faith in Christ. But because you believe in Christ, come and be baptized. Right? So that's the order. That's the separation. That means sal water baptism doesn't give you salvation. You are water baptized because you have experienced salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So the answer is simple, that water baptism is not necessary for salvation, but it is an expression of your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. So if a person believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, doesn't have an opportunity to be baptized, they die, will they go to heaven? Yeah. They have trusted in Jesus, they believed in Jesus, they'll go to heaven. Right? They didn't have the opportunity to obey that command. Yes, they failed to obey that command, that is true, but you're saved by grace through faith. Okay? And, and uh, so we understand that. Can a believer depart from Christ and lose his salvation? Again, this is a big question. Uh, that again, there's a lot of you know, there are two sides, there are two, you know, two opposing views on this in the Christian church. Uh, some people believe that once you're saved, you're always saved, you can never lose your salvation. But our position is the other, that which is uh, we understand from scripture, and I've listed all a lot of these scriptures where. It is possible for somebody who once truly believed in Christ to depart from the faith. It's possible. Which means that they forfeit their salvation. They lose their salvation. So the gift itself is eternal. The life of God is itself is eternal. So the nature of the gift and the nature of God's life is eternal. But whether you keep that gift or you throw it away is your choice. So God is giving you a gift. He says, this gift will never, you can keep on, it, you know, it'll never run out. So the gift is eternal. But whether you keep it or you throw it, that's your choice. Right? So what do we see? I mean, and I've given all of these scriptures, you can study them. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse four, verses 4 to 6, it's very clear that there are those who have tasted of the good things of God and then they go away. Then... The writer of Hebrews says it's impo it's almost impossible to renew them back, to bring them back to repentance if they fall away. It's so much more difficult. Hebrews 10, the Lord says, if anyone draws back, my soul will have no pleasure in him. First John 5, John writes, he says, if a brother you know, goes into this sin, this kind of sin which is unto death, then don't even pray. In First Timothy, there are many references of people who stray from their faith. Um, Romans 8, if a believer lives according to the flesh, he will die. Uh, John, uh, he, uh, uh, he challenges believers to, you know, to stay firm, not to drift away uh, from, uh, from the faith. Uh, Paul, 1 Corinthians 9, he talks about becoming disqualified. You know, he says, I watch over myself so that I don't become disqualified. You know, I have to keep my body in subjection. So he understands the possibility of being disqualified. Paul writes in Galatians 5 that those who practice the works of the flesh, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. He didn't say they'll make it to the kingdom of God and stay in lower compartment. No. He said they won't even get in there. You know, so it's very clear. Uh, then uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul writes that so even the elect could be deceived and go away from the faith. Second uh, Peter 2, Peter says, talks about people, you know, he says, it's better that they should not have known the truth itself. Uh, if after they know the truth, they're going back. It's like the dog going back to its vomit. Second Peter. Uh, Jesus said, if you endure to the end, you will be saved. So the question is, what if you don't endure to the end? Will you be saved then? You know. Uh, we see the possibility of names being blotted out of the book of life. Our faith without works is dead. That means if you don't live out your faith, then that faith is li lifeless. It doesn't have life. And uh, can a gift that is received be discarded? The answer is yes. Right. So based on all of these scriptures, our position is, yes, you can lose your salvation. But the traditional evangelical fellow position, which is mainly the Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and so on, they would say, no, you cannot lose your salvation. So there is an opposing view, but uh, 
you know, I've, I've just given you all the scriptures on why we think that we, we, we believe that a believer can lose his salvation. Is everything that happens the will of God? That's again another question that people debate about. Some people say God is in control, God is on the throne. We sing and we sing sometimes song, you know, God is in control or He's on the throne. And uh, it is true, God is on the throne and God is in control. But that doesn't mean He controls everything you and I do. Like I decided to sit on the chair. God didn't make me sit on the chair. I decided to sit on the chair. I drank the coffee. God didn't make me drink the coffee. I drank the coffee, right? So uh, there is God is sovereign, but He's given me, given each one of us a free will. We make the choices. God is not dictating those choices. He's given us the ability to make the choice, and He's told us how to make the choice. So what is a good thing to choose? But the choice is personally ours, right? So we cannot say. Everything that happens is the will of God. Why? Because some things are what you yourself did. And then there's a devil. God is not directing the devil. The devil is doing what he wants to do. Right? So the devil causes things to happen. We cause things to happen. So we can't say everything that happens is the will of God. No. But is God above all of that? Yes. Get, can God still fulfill his purpose in spite of our choices and what the devil does? Yes. That's why he's sovereign. He's God. He's greater than our wrongdoing. He's greater than what the devil does. So God can still fulfill his purpose. So in that sense, God is sovereign. He's almighty. He's all powerful. But he's not controlling your choice and mine. He's not dictating what the devil does. So we must understand that, right? So even here, there are two sides in the Christian church. One side, they say everything God will. So they fell down, oh, this is God's will. Hurt their knee, oh, God will. God is teaching me a lesson. Something stomach got upset, God is teaching me a lesson. <laughs> like, man, no, you didn't eat proper, proper food yesterday. That's why you got stomach. Don't blame God for everything, right? So, uh, so that is one side. But then there are the other side. Which where people say, you know, there's a balance between the sovereignty of God and the human will and what the devil is doing. We need to understand all of that. And so the answer is God is not in control of your choices. God is not in control of what the devil does in the sense that God is not telling the devil, oh, now you go in today, you have to tempt all these believers <laughs> because I want to test them. No, God is not telling the devil what to do. The devil is going and doing what he wants, right? So in that sense, God is not in control of things, okay? But when we say God is in control, we mean he is sovereign, he is almighty, he's above these things. He can still fulfill his purposes. Another question, should a believer tithe? Uh, this is again, some. Uh, that means should a believer give one-tenth of what they earn, what they receive, should they give... So here again, you know, in the Christian church, there are two sides to it. There are some who say, no, no, you don't have to tithe. Uh, you, that was tithing was under the old covenant. And then there's another side in the Christian church who say, no, we have to practice tithing. So how should we understand it? So first we see that tithing was in the Old Testament. And the first person to tithe was Abraham. So Abraham was not under the law. He was before the law. And he tithed. So when he had a victory, he met Melchizedek, who was, the, who was a king and priest. And he gave to Melchizedek a tenth of what he, he, he got in his battle and victory. Then we see even Jacob tithing. You know, Jacob promised God, God, if you bring me back, I will give you one tenth of everything you give me. He promised to give. This was again before the law, before Moses. Then the law came. That is, Moses was there, and in the law, Leviticus 27, Deuteronomy 14, Malachi 3, uh, God, God instituted tithing. That means he said, everybody must tithe. It was an instruction he gave. You must tithe. Tithe means you give one-tenth of the produce of your land, of your cattle, uh, those kinds of things. Those, those days they were, you know, uh, farmers and all that. So one-tenth you give. 
to God. And God said it is holy to the Lord. The tithe is holy. It belongs to God. And then when they established the tabernacle, the priesthood, God said the priests, because they are living and working, they don't have any income. So they will live, the priests and the Levites, they will live of the tithes. So the tithe served the purpose of providing for those who were serving in the tabernacle, in the altars, the priests, the Levites. And from there, they would even give to the poor. People who didn't have anything, they would give from the tithes and offerings that people brought. So when, the, when, they, when God said the tithe is holy, it doesn't mean everything is going to heaven. Nothing is going to heaven. Everything is here on the earth only. But it's being used in a way God prescribed, which is take care of the priests and the Levites and the poor. It's going for that. So the tithe offerings was used. So we understand from the Old Testament the purpose of the tithe. The purpose of the tithe was, it was an expression of worship. So when the people tithe, they said, God, we are worshipping you, we are honouring you, we are saying what we have has come from you. First purpose. Second, it was too practical. It was to help the people, the priests, the Levites and the poor people. It was very practical. That was the purpose of the tithe, to keep the work of the ministry going. So, when you come into the New Testament, one of the rules that we learned about interpreting scripture is, unless it is taken away, it means it continues. Unless it's explicitly said, don't do it anymore. So, when you come into the New Testament, we know God said you don't have to follow the law. You're not under law, you're under grace. So law is end. But tithing was there before the law. Abraham practiced tithing. Jacob practiced tithing. So tithing is not just about the law. It was given before the law. So yes, the law is done away with. But Abraham, we don't have a record of Isaac practicing it, but Jacob practiced it. So when you come to the New Testament, Jesus was telling the people, you should tithe, Matthew 23, 23. He said, you should do, you know, practice justice, equity, fairness, but you should also tithe, Matthew 23, 23. Then when you go to Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 to 10, there the writer of Hebrews explains very clearly, just as Abraham tithed to Melchizedek, and just as the people tithed to Levi, here we tithe and Jesus receives our tithe. Because he says Jesus is like Melchizedek. So Abraham tithe, he gave he tithes to Melchizedek. Today you and I tithe, we tithe to Jesus. He receives our tithes. Jesus is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So Abraham tithe, Melchizedek received. We tithe, Jesus receives our tithes. That's what he explains in verse 8, Hebrews 7, verse 8. So answer your question. Yeah, we believe tithing is for us to practice today, even in the New Testament, for these two, two reasons. We, through our tithing and offering, we are saying, God, we worship you. Everything comes from you. Second, it has to go for the work of the ministry, to take care of those who are serving God and the needs of the people. That's what it's used for. OK? Um, another question. Saul and the witch of Endor. So in 1 Samuel 28, I'll just go through these things quickly. You know, Samuel goes, Samuel has gone away from God, and he wants to know what is going to happen in battle. Is he going to win the battle or not? So he, and so going to, uh, he went to the prophets. God is not speaking through the prophets, uh, through the priests. 
So he goes to a witch. So imagine a king appointed by God going to a witch, saying, you tell me what's going to happen. And you call Samuel for me. So that is, that is a question. The witch calls a prophet. Samuel is dead. And they see Samuel coming up. And Samuel says, tomorrow you'll die. All right. So the question now is, was that really Samuel or what was that which they saw? So some people say uh, God allowed the witch to bring Samuel from the dead. And because what that, that thing said was real. Now, you know, we can debate about it. But my, my opinion is that that was an evil spirit pretending to be like Samuel. Because a witch has no power to bring Samuel, who is a prophet of God, who is in Abraham's bosom at that time in paradise, to bring him back to life. Okay. If a witch was so powerful, witch cannot do that. So it was an evil spirit impersonating Sam. Now again, we can. There are you know people who take both sides, uh, but this is our opinion. We can't we can't prove anything conclusively. But this is an explanation we can give that uh, evil spirits can impersonate because in the New Testament you find that. Satan appears like an angel of light. Satan, devil, he pretends to be like an angel of light. He pretends like that. So we see that. And so uh, we, we uh, you know, we, our position is that it's an evil spirit impersonating Samuel. Uh, but you know, you can't prove either side conclusively from scripture. Um, another question about drinking alcohol. So, Prince, we are coming closer to your tattoos question. <laughs> it's coming closer. It's coming up, I think, next one. <laughs> now, about drinking alcohol, what is your position? Because in some parts of the world, in the Christian church, pastors drink. You know, drinking is accepted. They don't see it as a sin. So that brings a lot of confusion because you will see this big evangelist is sitting and drinking big glass of beer. This my great prophet is drinking this big glass of wine, whatever. He is. And then you say like, hey, how come these these are believers, ministers of God? They're drinking. Uh, what is it? So in some parts of the world, it's like that. So this is what how we explain that uh, the Bible says drunkenness is sin. That means getting drunk is sin. That is very clear. So then there is this middle ground where people say, I will drink but not get drunk. See, that is the argument. So many, uh, I'm, I'm talking about, especially in the Western church, their argument is, I will drink but not get drunk. But that's a very gray area because at what point will you cross the line and become drunk? Yeah, it's very gray area. But many Christians, I'm saying even believers and even pastors and ministers in the church, they, they, they walk in this gray area. But our position is this, that, you know, we understand that there are believers who walk this gray area but our position is zero alcohol stay away from it completely no drinking at all why for two reasons number one a we don't need it paul said in first corinthians 6 12 also in first corinthians 10 23 he said all things are lawful for me but all things are not profitable all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of anything. So he said, you know, there may be things that are okay, but it's of no value to me. And there may be things that are okay, but I will not be controlled by anything. So that's the first question. The first thing is, there may be things that are okay, but you don't need it. Why? Why do you want it? 
And the second reason is this, that if we allow ourselves even a little bit now, then when we are under pressure, it is very likely we will cross the limits. Very likely. And you see many examples. Recently, I think I, uh, just two days back, I saw a news report. Again, this is the pastor of a world-famous pastor. Very. He, he got, again, he got, he got a, a police thing for drinking while under intoxication. Uh, and this is not the first time, but many times this happened for him. And it's very shameful. Pastor of huge... Uh, you know, now he's a former pastor because he had to resign for other problems. But he's well, world famous, well known, big ministry. Police got him for drinking under intoxication. He gets a ticket. News. Shameful. So why even drink a little bit? Because you don't know when you cross the line. And then all these things happen. So, so our position is uh, no drinking at all uh, stay away from it completely you'll be happy nothing you're not losing anything now we don't go to the extreme where some people say oh because if i put perfume perfume has alcohol or <laughs> oh i won't use sanitizer i won't use sanitizer as alcohol <laughs> no we don't go to that extreme we use sanitizers we use perfume deodorants uh, you know there may be some products that use a little bit of alcohol to make it soluble and so on and so forth we use those things, but you're not getting drunk or you're not, you know, introducing that much alcohol into your body. You're just, it's serving a purpose, sanitizing hands, you're killing the germs and all that. Uh, or when you go for the, go to the hospital, they put alcohol, clean your skin, whatever. Those are all practical things. It's not harmful in that sense. Clothing and attire, is it already make, wear jewelry and makeup? The answer, yeah, you dress modestly. Uh, Paul is not, uh, Paul or Peter, they're not saying don't wear jewelry because, you know, in Peter, 1 Peter 3, Peter is pointing to holy women of God in the Old Testament. And you can easily see that Sarah was wearing jewelry. So it's not like they never wore jewelry, they wore it. But the emphasis is on, you know, take care of your inner person and walk in godliness and modesty. That's the emphasis, not saying don't wear um, jewelry. And then we come to Prince's quest. Oh, Prince's quest. Tattoos. So is it all right to have tattoos? So we see, uh, again, here's something only in the Old Testament. We see in the Old Testament where um, God specifically said, don't cut or make marks or tattoos on your skin. And if you look at these verses that I listed out, Leviticus 19, Deuteronomy 14, Jeremiah 16, Jeremiah 41, um, the context is especially because the, un, the heathen people, they did it as an act of worship to their gods. That's the context. So it wasn't they were just doing for decoration, but they were doing it as an act of worship and god told his people don't do that the context is they are they are worshiping their gods and goddesses through what they were doing cutting marks and you know sometimes beat people beat themselves or they you know scratch them as an act of worship to their gods and gods and god said don't do that don't disfigure yourself and so on so that's the context in which those things were given now, the New Testament is silent on this. There's nothing yes or no about tattoos. So how should we look at it? And I'm just sharing with you our perspective. Uh, there are others who may differ, and that's fine. But our perspective is uh, we don't say all forms of tattoo is sin. You know, suppose you, have a, you put a cross or you put a verse on your skin. Oh, you're going to hell. We don't say that. Right? Somebody wants to, and today, you know, there used to be a time when doing tattoos was harmful for the body. Today, uh, they have device ways where, you know, the chemicals they use and everything is safe. So it's not like, um, it's not 
in any way injurious necessarily to your physical health. So that also is taken care of. So we don't say, ha, oh, if you have a tattoo, you're going to hell. We don't say that. Uh, and so if we use these Old Testament scriptures to say, uh, look at these scriptures, therefore, if you have a tattoo, you'll go to hell, then we must also say, if you pierce your nose, if you pierce your ears, you're wearing a earring, you're going to hell. Then all oh, there are so many ladies, uh, they wear earrings, nose rings. Sometimes they wear uh, rings on the eye. <laughs> so see, you're pierced your body, you're going to go to hell. Is that true? No. Right? They, they use it as a part of their ornaments and uh, makeup and stuff like that. So we can't, you know, we, we can't enforce that. And then there are also other instructions under the Old Testament where it says, you know, a woman cannot wear anything that, that a man wears or uh, the priest must have the head covered, wear this kind of clothing. Uh, the priest cannot have any bald patch or he cannot cut his beard, so on and so forth. Uh, so then uh, then all those things with rules will also apply. They're all from the Old Testament itself. So how, what should we do? Right. So again, this is our position, which is we don't judge anybody if you have a tattoo. You know, some people before they became believers, they did all kinds of tattoos. You know, some, some of them very weird tattoos. Then after that, they got saved. They became believer. Then they can't take off the tattoo. It's already there on the body for life. It may be something evil also. They must have put it before they got saved. Uh, are we going to say they're going to hell? No. They're saved. It's of the heart. Right? So we, ex we, we just welcome them. We don't judge. Or if a believer wears a tattoo, you know, they may make small things here and there. That's their choice. We don't. Uh, would I go and get a tattoo? Personal choice. That's a personal choice. I, I till now I don't want to get a tattoo. <laughs> I don't know if that changed my mind, but <laughs> I have no interest in getting a tattoo. So I'm not going to do it. If somebody somebody does it, it's their choice. I'm not going to judge them, right? I'm not going to condemn them. Uh, so just leave it. Yeah. Okay. So to answer your question, uh, it's not wrong. We will not judge people. Either, whether they got it before they believe, became believers or after they became believers, that's their choice. Uh, it's, they want to do it. Are they going to go to hell for it? No, because salvation is of the heart. Uh, and we just leave it at that. Okay, so the question, the question that uh, Prince is asking is, should we tell believers not to get a tattoo, right? I won't waste my time. Uh, so if they want to get it, you get it. If you don't want to, I mean, we don't go tell telling ladies, don't wear makeup, don't wear earrings, don't wear nose rings. How, how we can do all that? <laughs> the same thing, right? If you're talking about tattoos, you're also talking about piercings. Piercing the piercing ear, nose thing, all the kinds. Of so, so I said, don't bother. That's their choice. You know, how we can go and control all these things? Then it just, uh, there's no end to that. Okay. I think this is the last one on the Sabbath. Is uh, why do we not observe the Sabbath, Saturday, as the Sabbath? So, a uh, couple of things. One is in the Old Testament, God kept. Saturday, the seventh day, as a day of rest. And it was part of the Ten Commandments. Because he wanted them to honor God and focus on God on that day. And when you come into the New Testament, we see some changes. First change we see is uh, the church started meeting on the first day, Sunday, because that was the resurrection day. So they started, they kept, they started following that instead of following the Saturday. So that change happened in the early church. So they started observing Sunday as the Lord's day or the day when they would gather together for worship and prayer and so on. So that change was made. And then later on in the, in the, in the, in the writing of the apostles, um, we see Paul telling us that uh, we are not obligated to observe Sabbaths, but we can choose any day we want. Uh, some he says in Romans 13, uh, Romans 14, he says, 
Some people treat all days the same. Some people treat certain days special. You do what you want. Let every person be fully persuaded in their own mind. So when you come into the New Testament, Colossians 2, we do not observe Sabbaths. We do not observe special days, feasts, and so on. We treat every day as holy unto the Lord. And yes, we gather together when everybody's gathering. So in some parts of the world, they gather together on Tuesdays. Some parts of the world, they may gather together on Fridays. Some parts, many parts of the world, they gather together on Sundays. Fine, whichever day. So you gather together whenever believers are gathering together. And you treat every day as holy to the Lord. That's your choice. So in the New Testament, we are free from necessarily observing the seventh day, Saturday, as the Sabbath. We are free from observing the Old Testament feasts. We observe every day. We honor God every day. And we make it a point to gather with believers on whichever day they are gathering in that part of the world. That's it. Okay? All right. So whatever questions I have put down, we've covered that. Let me just check the chat if there are any questions from our online students. And then we will take any questions, any any other questions other than what we've covered. All right, let's see. Uh, Kennedy has a question. Why do we have priests now, even though Christ is now our high priest? Um, and then, but isn't that isn't the reason why Satan can appear as an angel, right? Because he was an angel before. Okay, so Ke Kennedy's question is. Why do we have priests now, even though Christ is now our high priest? Now, certain ecclesiastical orders have priests, but we don't find that in the New Testament. The New Testament says all believers are priests, right? Uh, First Peter chapter 2, Revelation chapter 1. We are all, every believer is a priest unto God. And Christ Jesus is our high priest. So that's the, what the New Testament teaches. Now, in the church, Jesus has said certain people like apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. Those are functions he set, uh, appointed by the Lord to edify the body of Christ. This is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, and also 1 Corinthians 12, 27, 28, where Christ has appointed certain ministries to serve the church. But this function of the priest is given to all believers. That's New Testament. So we don't have to pay attention. If somebody says, I'm a priest, well, every believer is a priest. Okay. Your next question, Kennedy, is uh, why, can, why Satan appears as an angel of light? So right now, Satan, yeah, Satan used to be an angel, an archangel. Um, Isaiah the 14th chapter, Ezekiel chapter 28. So Satan used to be an archangel, but he was dismissed from that place. So he no longer has that kind of capacity and glory as an archangel. He is a fallen angel, and he's an angel of darkness. He's no longer an angel of light. He used to be Lucifer. Lucifer means son of the morning, very bright. But now he's an angel of darkness. He is the lord of darkness, the prince of the air. But he impersonates what is of the light. So that's what Paul is warning us in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, when he says, you know, that Satan himself appears as an angel of light. Uh, say the messenger of Satan, they appear as angel of light. So he's impersonating. Uh, he was an angel of light. He's no longer, he is the prince of darkness right now. Right. Any other questions which we have not covered, Prince? Yes. So I can't hear you. Um, we have? Oh, yeah, why don't you? Yes, Prince, use the mic. So. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I got your question. So the question is, we have chapter and verse that says don't get drunk, but we don't have chapter and verse for other sins like don't smoke or whatever, right? So how can we explain to people, right? Obviously, uh, we have to understand that uh, the, the truths of Scripture was given many hundreds, thousands of years ago. So obviously, God was not going to point out every kind of sin that would be done. For example, the Bible says, thou shalt not shoot. <laughs> Does it mean I can shoot? No. The principle is thou shalt not kill. How you kill, whether you kill with your hand or gun or what, but the Bible times they didn't have guns. So Bible, there's no chapter and verse, thou shalt not shoot. No. Or thou shalt not use a, you know, whatever. So obviously not, not every sin is itemized in scripture, but the principle is there. Right? The principle is your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So don't do anything that destroys your body, whether it's alcohol or whether it's smoking or any other forms of drugs. So Bible never says thou shall not take drugs, you know. So it's not there. Now, uh, does that mean people can take drugs? No. It's hurting your body, destroying your body. So the, that's the principle. Don't destroy your body with anything. So we apply that. So we can take, for example, we can take the scripture, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and apply it to any context, right? Whether it's smoking or drugs or any other form that is abusive to the body. We say, don't do it. Just take care of your body because it is a temple of the holy. That's how you apply. Yes. Vimal, uh, Chirag, then we come back to you. We'll go in turns. Go ahead. Sorry? What if a believer suicides? Yeah. So I will share with you uh, what I believe. Uh, there may be some who disagree with it. So, um, if a believer commits suicide, will he go to heaven? So, my persuasion is yes, he will go to heaven. Right? Because there was some circumstance under which he committed, he or she would have committed suicide. Maybe usually it's a lot of mental pressure. Right? They're going through a crisis in life. Um, they couldn't. They didn't. Didn't. They were not able to handle it, and so they did this. They took the drastic step. But were they saved? Other believer? Yes, they believed in Jesus Christ. But something in life was so much put them under so much stress that they took their own life. So they're not going to lose their salvation because of that. For example, suppose you think of a good believer. Uh, he gets angry with a person. Before he has time to say sorry, just imagine, the Lord comes, the trumpet sounds. In a twinkling of an eye, the Bible says, we will be, bodies will be changed, will be taken up. Like that, everything happens. He has no time to say, I'm sorry. Will he be saved? He, he just got, he got angry, anger is sin. But in a moment, rapture happens. Will he be saved? Yeah, he'll be saved. Why? Because he's saved by grace through faith. He didn't have time to repent of that becoming angry, whatever. I'm just giving anger as an example. But some sin that he committed, uh, he didn't have time to say sorry. He didn't have time to repent. But will he be saved? Yeah. Now, the Bible says anger or hatred is equal to murder. Jesus said it. Right? Matthew 5. So... Anger, murder, equal. Now, I'm not saying we should go and get angry with people or we should go and murder people. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just giving an example. So that's why I believe that if a believer 
because of the pressure, the situation they and their own life, uh, I don't think they will lose their salvation. Now, on the other side, there are people who argue that uh, Revelation 21 verse 8 says that the cowardly, cowardly, those who are being fearful, they won't enter heaven. They go to hell, Revelation 21 8. So they say suicide is a cowardly act, therefore they will not go to heaven. You know, they're, they're, not, they're not having faith, they're fearful. So they use that as an example or as a scripture to say, if you commit suicide, you won't go to heaven. But uh, I, 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 I choose to disagree. You know, it's not just uh, that suicide is only uh, an act of cowardice. It's beyond that. There's a lot of pressure, stress that has caused that person to take their own life. And so it's not just an act of cowardice. There is other things involved. Right? So that's how I would respond to that question. But you know, there's no definite chapter and verse to do that. Bimal, your question. Last question. I think we have three minutes. Yeah. So your, your question is about wedding, marriage. If somebody comes to the Lord from another faith, that is from a different faith, they come to the Lord, um, can that person get married whenever they want to? Is that what your question is? Can they do marriage when? Or oh, in their tradition? Are you meaning just the tradition? Or are you meaning in the temple or the mosque? See, there, there is a difference between culture like how we do in the cultural tradition, and should they get married in a temple, that is with the priest and all that, or with the mosque? Are you just talking about the culture? You're just talking about the cultural thing. Yeah. So, uh, When you say Pandit, are you meaning Christian priest or are you meaning huh? Hindu cult? Oh, so your question is, I was trying to understand your question, right? So your question is, if somebody comes from a Hindu faith, they become a believer in Jesus Christ, can they get married in the Hindu tradition? So it's a very difficult question, right? It's a very difficult question because uh, we've had some challenges there. But let me say, let me give you my perspective right so god wants us to follow his ways right so as far as possible we tell always get married in the christian way like with you know you're, you're making your vows before the lord and you do that but we have also run into situations where that's not been possible because this person has come from a non-christian background and sometimes uh, the person, he or she, would be getting married also from a non-Christian background. And there is so much pressure from the family. They say, if you want us to come, you know, you, you have to, we will do the wedding in the Hindu way. So this is where we leave it as a choice to the couple. We can advise, you know, you get married in the church. We will do your marriage. This is how we'll do it. But there's so much of pressure from the family. So we leave, leave it to them as a choice. You make your choice. There are some who've made the choice to say, whether our parents come or not, we will get married only in the Christian way. So then we have conducted the wedding. In some cases, parents didn't come. Some cases, parents came, family came. We did a Christian. But some couples, after becoming believers, because of the family pressure, they will do both. They will go, they will have that thing happening in the village or wherever, you know, where they can. They let the parents do what they want. They'll sit there for one day quietly. <laughs> then they'll come back here and then they will do a Christian wedding, right? So we leave it to their level of faith. You know, we can't, we don't want to force anything because 
people are at different levels of their journey and uh, they're going through different circumstances. So we have seen both things happen. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, so I guess this is a very challenging situation because the children, they don't want to hurt their parents. After all, parents have taken care of them for so many 25 years, paid for all so much they've given, you know, so they don't want to hurt their parents at the same, you know, uh, so they, whatever they can do to please make the parents happy and also to say thank you. you know, they've given, they brought them this far in life to say thank you. They, they do that. So we leave it to the individuals. We don't force our views on them. Last, last point. Okay. Yes. Can we, so the question is, can we attend weddings where both the Christian pastor and the Hindu priest are doing their thing? That's your choice. I mean, you know, you're not going to be affected by what the Hindu priest does. You're covered by the blood of Jesus, but you love these people. They have maybe taken a few steps to believe in Jesus Christ. They are still to grow in their faith. Maybe they're new in their faith, whatever. You love them. So as a sign of support to them, yeah, I don't see anything wrong in going there, right? Uh, because anyway, you know, the, the goal is to help them grow in their faith, you know, and they are learning how to do it. They're making their journey. We stand with them. And soon, at some point, they will be able to take the full standard, you know. But there's so many cultural, social, family issues that have to be worked through. It's not easy. OK? All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll wrap up for today. So I, uh, I think we will, you know, we will not have classes next couple of weeks. I will put up the assignments. Is that OK? You're all happy, right? Okay. <laughs> I'll put up the assignments. You take your time to do the assignments. Uh, all right, let's pray and we'll close. Father, we thank you for this course for things we've been able to talk about, open our minds to address. And I pray for all the students online, in class, that we will continue to grow in these things. We'll continue to understand these things and uh, apply them as we serve you and your people. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just look out for the assignments, the assessments.